theyeshiva.net. Okay, today's class is dedicated by the Yitzchak Koenig in honor of his birthday on Oder Beis, the ninth day of Oder. Thank you, happy birthday, and a year of tremendous Hatzlacha. Arichis Yom Veshanam Toivis with all the blessings. Thank you very much. The name of the Megillah that we read on Purim, the scroll that we read on Purim, of course, is called Megillah's Esther, which literally means the scroll of Esther. Sometimes it's actually just called Esther, the book of Esther. And uh, the question has been raised over the generations, why is this the name of the Megillah? You would think that since, as the Megillah points out, it was really the work of two people together, was Mordechai and Esther. In fact, as the Megillah says more than once, Vesmaimar Mordechai Esther Oysa. Esther followed the instructions, the guidance, the mentorship of Mordechai. Mordechai also has raised this girl, as the Megillah says also in chapter 2, that she was an orphan, she had no mother and father. And Mordechai, Lokach Loi, Mordechai, uh, embraced her, took care of her, raised her as a daughter, Lavas. So, obviously, this was mentorship, not just on a spiritual level, but also Mordechai took care of her, raised her because she didn't have parents, as the Megillah describes. And throughout the entire ordeal, it was literally Mordechai and Esther together, a very, very powerful uh, power team, you could say, who brought down Haman, transformed the decree, and saved the day, and saved the Jewish people. But it's interesting that the name of the Megillah, you would think, would be called maybe Megillah's Mordechai ve Esther. Maybe Esther was the queen, so you would call it Megillah's Esther or Mordechai. Maybe even Megillah's Mordechai, because Mordechai was the one who initiated, who inspired Esther. And even when Esther had to go into the king the first time to, to, to start initiating the process of defeating Haman, it was based on Mordechai's requests, instructions, guidance. Esther was hesitant. Mordechai pushed her. Nonetheless, the name is exclusively Megillus Esther. It's Esther's scroll, the book of Esther. The explanation for this is based on a story that the Gemara describes how the Megillah came about to be written and how the entire holiday of Purim was established. And here we immediately see the unique connection to Esther, and uniquely Esther, not Mordechai and Esther. So if you look in your first source, it comes from Megillah, Zion, Aleph. This means Tractate Megillah, Talmud, Tractate Megillah, page 7a. We have it in the Hebrew, and I took from Safari an English translation. Omar Rab Shmuel Bar Yehuda. Rab Shmuel, the son of Yehuda, said, he shared a story. Esther sent a message to the sages. What was the message? Establish me for future generations. Very interesting expression. Kavuni comes from the word kavua, kva, to establish. Right? Like likvaya mezuzah, to establish a mezuzah. Kvias means an establishment. Kvouni, establish me for generations. What does it mean, establish me for generations? What is that supposed to mean? So if you take a look in the second paragraph, Rashi, we have a Rashi. Rashi gives a comment. Second paragraph in the source sheet. Kovuni, liyamtef, ulikriya, liyos li l'shem. Literally, the translation is establish me as a yamtef. In other words, establish this story which happened with me Establish it as a holiday. It could have just been a beautiful story told. Didn't have to become a Yom Tif. Didn't have to become an official Yom Tif with all the mitzvahs connected to the Yom Tif. No, this was Esther's request. Don't just celebrate now the salvation. Kavuni, make it an established holiday, an established festival. The second thing she says, Velikriya. We should read the Megillah. We should read the story. Kriya, like Kriya Satira, Kriya to read. In other words, not just a Yom Tif. There should be reading the story every year on this Yom Tif, reading the Megillah. And he, she adds, Leo is Lila Shame. So this should be 
my name, I should have a name. Leos li shame, I should have a name. This should be a name for me. Obviously, when you have a holiday and you're reading the Megillah and you're celebrating it, this is Esther's name, Leos li shame. So back, back, back to the first source. This is Kavuni Ladaris. Establish me for generations as a holiday. Read the story and make a name for me. Shol Chula, the Chacham were not excited. They responded back. They sent back Kina at Salano You are creating anti-Semitism. You're creating jealousy. You're creating envy. You're creating angst. Why? Because they were saying, this will arouse the wrath. Kina is like the wrath, the jealousy, the anger, the hatred of the nations against us. Because basically, the Megillah tells the story of the terrible, devastating defeat of Haman and all of the anti-Semites who wanted to kill the Jews and the absolute victory and triumph of the Jewish people and the wars they fought. We don't need this. (laughs) We don't need this. That's what the Chachamim read, sent back to Esther. Shol Chalahem. Esther sent back a message. She says, <laughs> Don't think you're going to hide this story. I am already written in the chronicles of the king of Madai and Persia. In other words, this story is well known. Anything that the Megillah will publicize is already known. At least let the Jews know the story. <laughs> What Esther here is obviously is saying a very powerful message. Jews think we're going to do this and do this and say this and say this. We said they're going to love us. They know everything. Let the Jews find out the story. Let the Jews know how to live. And you know what? They agreed. They didn't have an answer. (laughs) How do I know they agreed? Here we are celebrating Purim 2,500 years later. Esther triumphed over the sages. They agreed and they established the Yamtiv. And then the Gemara continues. This wasn't enough. Shalchalam Esther Lechachamim. Esther sent another message to the sages. Kasvuni Ledairis. Write me down for generations. I want this to be written down. Kasvuni Ledairis. What does this mean? You can make a holiday, you could tell the story, you can read the story, but the Megillah won't necessarily become part of the Tanakh, it won't become part of the Kisve HaKodesh. You don't have to read it from the scroll, reading every single word as a holy Megillah, as part of the holy Tanakh. It didn't have to be like that. It could be a holiday, like Hanukkah, for example. Hanukkah, we celebrate, but we don't have a Megillah that halachically you have to read. I mean, there's a Megillah Santiyachas that some, cost, that some, some people read. So, but the, the, the sanctity of the Megillah with a blessing before it and a blessing. <laughs> okay, very good. Okay. Why should he wait till Purim? Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. 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 They say that there was once a Jew. He was, uh, let's call him an alcoholic the way it is. He liked to drink. And uh, when it came the month of Adar, Rosh Chodesh Adar, till the end of Adar, you couldn't find him sober. From the first day in Adar to the last day of Adar, he was completely drunk. I came to him and said, what's this uh, heter? One day, Purim, what's this thing? 30 days. He says, it's exactly what it was meant to be. He says, no. Purim is one day. (laughs) Purim is one day. So you drink one day. Why are you drinking a whole month? He says, you don't understand. Why did Haman tell Achashverosh and ask him to make a decree that we're going to exterminate the entire Jewish nation in one day? Well, he was stupid. What if a few Jews run away? What if a few Jews are hiding? The next day it's all over. You have to be a fool. Give it a few weeks. Give it a few months. Give it a few years. Why put it in one day? So I'll tell you why. Haman was a brilliant man. He knew 50-50 he may not succeed. And if he doesn't succeed, it's going to be a holiday. At Nishi Kent Faginen. The Eden, more than one day, he didn't Fagin. He knew he might lose. He knew it's going to become a holiday. And he didn't want Jews to have more than one day celebration. He says, because Haman was stingy. And didn't want us to celebrate for more than one day, I have to suffer? Ichtaf Leiden, because Haman was such a Russia Marusha, and he didn't forgive Jews another holiday? I don't. I do a whole month the way it was supposed to be, the way he really wanted to do it. I do a whole month. I'm the only one celebrating Purim. So you can have a holiday. 
and you could tell the story, you can even read the story, and Esther's name would be established, but she wanted something else. She wanted Kosvuni Lodotus. She wanted it should be canonized, as we say, canonized as part of a Ksiva, and you read it from the Megillah, and we look inside the Megillah, the Megillah is the Kisri HaKadosh, that's what she also wanted. And here the Gemara continues, they argued with her again. They said, we, we don't have a right to just add another Sefer to the Tanakh. You may have written it, Mardachem may have written it, but we don't have a right. And they argued with her again. And then the Gemara says that at the end they agreed, and they realized that in Chumash there's already a hint, Ksoiv Zoiz Zikarim B'Sefer, when Moshe said, told you, Hashem told you, Moshe, write the story of Amalek, Ksoiv Zoiz Zikarim B'Sefer, four words, write this as a memory B'Sefer, they realized there has to be four different books, there is this Parshas B'Shalach, and this Parshas Kiseitse, and then there's the story of Amalek in the Nevi'im, and then there's one more B'Sefer in Megillus Esther. They saw Esther was right, and indeed it became part of the Tanakh. Who did this? Esther, doesn't say Mardachai. Shalchalam Esther. You would think this is something that Esther should have delegated to Mardachai. But especially Mardachai was the head of the Sanhedrin. Who established Yom Tovim? The Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin is the body of 71 spiritual leaders ordained person to person all the way back to Moshe. Moshe was the one who with the instruction of Hashem ordained 70 people to assist him in spiritually leading the Jewish people of Parshas Baalois. And from then this body was con- continued from generation to generation, and there had to be musmach, ish mupiyishad Moshe Rabbeinu, meaning literally ordained all the way back to Moshe. Moshe ordained 70, and then it continued for generations, generations, till it ceased a few hundred years after the destruction of the second base Hamikdash. The Jewish people simply didn't have the cohesiveness and the serenity to be able to do it, that quality of leadership. So this was a centralized body. There was no such a thing by the Sanhedrin, the Sfarim do this, the Ashkenazim do this. You have this minute, I have this minute. There was a unified Sanhedrin, and they made a verdict. And Mordechai was the head of the Sanhedrin. He always, even after he became the prime minister, he remained in the Sanhedrin. He remained a member in the Sanhedrin. So you would think such a question, Esther should have delegated or sent to Mordechai. Let Mordechai decide. Esther sent it, and it's only her who did it. And we see she had to fight for it. It was a debate, and she was victorious. This is the Gemara Talmud Bavli, the Babylonian Talmud. If you look at the next source, Yerushalmi Megillah, there's two streams of Gemara. There's Yerushalmi and Bavli. Yerushalmi is the Gemara that was written in Eretz Yisrael, edited by Rabbi Yochanan, a hundred years before the Babylonian Talmud, written in Bavl in Iraq. Yerushalmi, Meseches Megillah, there we have another detail in the story. Ma also, Mardechai ve Esther. What did Mardechai and Esther do? Kosvu Igeres, they sent a letter, Vesholchul Rabbi Seinu. And they sent this letter to our sages, to our teachers, to our rebbes. Shekein Amru Lehem. They said to them, Mekablin Atem Aleichem Shnei Yamim Alala B'chol Shana. Would you accept these two days, Purim and Shushan Purim, as a holiday every year? So some say that there's an argument here, because in Yerushalmi it says Mordechai and Esther. In the Bavli it's only Esther, but the truth is they're talking about two separate things. In the Yerushalmi they're talking about the holiday. Mordechai and Esther both wanted it to be established as a Yom Tov. Shnei Yamim Alala B'chol Shana. Esther requested something specific, not just a Yom Tif. She requested Lekriya, it should be read, and Leos Li Lashem, my name should be established. And then she requested Kosvuni Lodotus, it should become written in the Megillah as part of the Tanakh, that Mordechai didn't ask for. That's why if you read the Megillah, you'll see there's a very interesting Pasuk, and you see the, the change, very subtle change of how it describes the establishment of Purim and the Megillah as a, as an, a yearly holiday. If you take a look in the Megillah itself, Megillah says to Perik Tes, Pasuk Lama, this is already the end of the Megillah, chapter 9, second to the last chapter. So it speaks about the fact that Mordechai and Esther sent out books and letters to all the Jewish people that they should observe the days of Purim. So they said, L'kayim esimei ha-Purim e'le bizmaneyam, k'asherki ha-maleya Mordechai ha-Yehudi ve'ester ha-Malka, v'k'asherki mu al-nafshim v'al-zarim divri ha-tzayim es v'zakos. They sent a message that the Jews should observe the days of Purim, just like Mordechai HaYehudi and Esther HaMalka, Mordechai the Jew, and Esther the Queen, observed these days. Now the new Pasuk, Umaymar Esther Kiyem, Divrei HaPurim Ha'elu V'nichtav Basefer. It's the word of Esther that affirmed these words of Purim, this story of Purim, and it was written in a Sefer. 
So you see, the first Pasuk, he says, Mordechai and Esther both observed the holiday. But then he says it was Maimar Esther, not Mordechai anymore, the word of Esther that affirmed Divrei HaPurim Ha'elah, the story or the words of Purim, and it was written in a Sefer. So Rashi explains, what does it mean? Maimar Esther, the words of Esther. So he says, Esther Biksha Me'ez Chach Me'adar Lekava. Because Esther was the one who made a request from the sages of the generation to establish it as a holiday, to establish it as a day when we read the story and it should have her name, and that this should become written together with other ksuvim, together with the other writings in the Tanakh, because of Esther, it became written in a holy book, and that's why we don't just tell the story or read it by heart, or one person reading it, and the other person could just hear the story, but rather, it's all from ink on a parchment with all the halachas, how you have to write the Megillah. In other words, it's a holy script and a holy writing and a holy sefer, and you can't miss a word, etc., etc. So now we right away understand why it's called Megillah's Esther. This explains it very gishmak, because this was really the whole idea of having a Megillah that you have to read and read it from the script and consider it a sefer of the Tanakh. This was not even Mordechai's idea, even though Mordechai was a major part of the story. And as we see from Yerushalmi, Mordechai wanted it should be a Yom Tif. But this particular element of Megillah, both to read it and to write it as a, as a Sefer in the Tanakh, this was Esther's unique contribution. But this only brings the question to the next phase. Why is it that Esther was the one who wanted this so much? Even though Mordechai obviously appreciated the miracle, but Esther was the one who goes to the sages and says, Kavuni Ladoiris and Kasvuni Ladoiris. And as you see, she does it in the singular. She says, Establish me for generations and write down me for generations. Now, obviously, she's not only writing about herself, it's the whole story. She was part of the story, an indispensable part of the story, the heroine of the story. But that's how she defines it Establish me. And Rashi, to make it clear, says, Because Li Yais Li Lashem, I should have a name. And commentators over the generations asked, what does that mean exactly? Was Esther really just looking for a name, publicity? I want that my name should be carried over. Well, certainly she got that fulfilled. And that's why it's called Megillah's Esther. <laughs> it's her name, Megillah of Esther. And it's a safer of Esther. She takes credit for it. She initiated it. She fought for it. She inspired it. It has her name. It doesn't have anybody else's name. But what is it that Esther was searching for so profoundly and even more than Mordechai. Now Mordechai obviously agreed to this because he was one of the Sanhedrin. <laughs> so he was part of the decision process as well. He was on both sides of the, of the coin. But the initiation came per, specifically from Esther. And we don't see that Mordechai told Esther to do this. Because actually Mordechai would have been more qualified to do this. This was his realm, his domain. Halacha, establishing the halacha, deciding like to the Jewish people. This wasn't Esther's, this wasn't Esther's personal uh, obligation or responsibility or field of influence. She was a queen that remained a queen in Persia. There's one opinion you're saying that the Persians wrote it. So that's what Esther told them. Esther said, I'm not writing a new story. They wrote the story. They know all the information. Right, but the actual Megillus Esther was written by Mordechai Esther and the Chachamim of the time for the Jewish people. And as the Gemara says, it was written with divine inspiration. It went into the Tanakh as a sacred book. Not just a text of history, but a text of Torah. A text of Torah has a different quality. It means every word is precise and meticulous. It's with Ruach HaKadosh, it's with divine inspiration. The Gemara proves it in Masechus Megillah. It says, for example, Vayoymer Haman Beliboy. Haman said in his heart. How do we know what Haman said in his heart? Somebody knows what Haman said in his heart. So obviously someone knew what Haman was having. And he couldn't even interview him later because he was gone at, at some point. And it's not like he would have been happy <laughs> to be a participant in the writing of the Megillah. Right? <laughs> So all of this will be understood. There's a very famous question, and we mentioned it last week as well, in the story of Rabbah and Abzeda with the meal of Purim, that Megillah is the only Sefer in the entire Tanakh that doesn't have Hashem's name. Even Shir Hashirim has Hashem's name once. Megillah says it doesn't even have Hashem's name even once. And that becomes, ah, huh? Hastar. And that becomes even more perplexing. You would think at some point, maybe after the miracle at least, they should say thank you. They said thank you to Hashem. Not only that, Esther told Mordechai to gather all the Jews and to fast for three days. For what purpose? To pray, to daven. <laughs> Why are they fasting for three days? Why are they gathering together? 
but there's no explicit mention of Hashem. The Evan Ezra, Rabbi Avram Evan Ezra from Spain, asked this question, and he gives a very interesting answer. He says, because Mordechai and Esther felt that the Megillah is going to be copied and translated into other languages, and because of that, they were afraid when they translated the nations, therefore they're going to substitute Hashem's name with their pagan deities. So because of that, they didn't put in Hashem's name. Other commentators have a very difficult time with that. I mean, that can happen with anything. The whole Tanakh was translated. That's the fact. And people translate the way they want to translate. That's why it deprived the Jewish people from any shame Hashem in the entire Megillah. Not in the beginning, not at the end. Not even once. It says like, it's, and it's, it's very strange because the whole story of the Megillah is essentially an insane miracle that happened. Insane, I mean, extraordinary. Without, without, credit, without credit to the ultimate author. And it becomes part of the Tanakh. It's very hard to understand. Especially when Esther says, Leos Lila Shem. I want my name to be established here. You would think, I want Hashem's name to be established. She says, Leos Lila Shem. I want my name to be established. But this really captures the whole uniqueness of Esther, what she represented, and therefore what the Megillah comes to teach. And the way to understand this is, if you look in your next source, the Gemara in Chulin, Kuf Lamates, this is one, two, three, four, sixth source from the top. This is tract, the Gemara tractate Chulin, Kuf Lamates is 139b. Esther Minatayra Minayin. What's the source of Esther? What's the origin of the name Esther in Torah? And the answer is famously quotes a Pasuk from Parshas Vayelech, the end of Dvarim. Moshe Rabbeinu speaks about a future time in history, Vanoichi Haster, Aster esponai by Yaimahu. Shem says, I will hide, double hide. I will hide and conceal my face on that day. And that's Haster Aster. The question is, why did it say Haster Aster twice? I will hide, I will conceal. So the Baal Shem Tev has a famous interpretation. Haster Aster means that the Hester is Behester. The concealment is also concealed. Sometimes something can be concealed, but you know that there's a concealment. The fact that you know that there's a concealment, a person goes to search. You know that there's a treasure concealed or there's a truth concealed, I begin to search. But what if the concealment is concealed? So when the Hester is Behester, that's a real Hester. Because now I don't even have access to the truth anymore. Because I think that concealment is revelation, there's nothing to search for. If nothing is concealed, what do I have to search for? This is a much for, deeper form of concealment. They tell a story to illustrate this. The Maggid of Mizrich had a son... His name was Rabbi Avram. They called him Rabbi Avram HaMalach. Rabbi Avram the angel. I told the story about him last week. So Rabbi Avram HaMalach was once, once came into his father's room and he was crying while he, when he was a little child. He said, Vos vein, still, what are you crying? So he said he was playing a game of hide and seek with his friends. So he says, no, what happened? He says, I hid. It was a very good hiding place and they couldn't find me. So he says, so you won the game. What's the problem? That's the point. You should hide well. They shouldn't be able to find you. And you come out the winner. He says, and they stopped searching. I hid so well, they gave up. They stopped searching. So that's why he was crying. So they say that the Maggid of Mizrich started to cry. When he heard this from his boy, he started to cry. And he turned to Hashem and he said, you concealed yourself very well. I'm afraid you concealed yourself so well that there's going to be a day they're going to stop searching. When I know that there's a concealment, I understand, like the awareness of a disease, of an illness, of a problem, is already half the remedy, just the awareness of it. means that it's a level where somebody can be so trapped, they don't even know it's a trap. They're exile, they call redemption. Dysfunctionality is called functionality. Disassociation is called association. A person doesn't have the awareness. So that's the second level of Esther. Of Esther. Why is this associated with Esther? And the answer to this is because this describes not just Esther individually, but it describes the era, the zeitgeist, the reality, the circumstances that Esther had to confront. Because this was the first time in history there was a decree on the entire Jewish nation and the entire people lived under the dictator who issued this decree. Even Parai made a decree on the male children. He said the girls could stay alive. Throughout the generations afterwards, there were wars and violence and challenges. But the first time that somebody should have the chutzpah 
to make a decree, Lashmid, Larig, Ula Abed, Eskola, Yehudi, Minar, Vadzak, and Tav, and Asher, Be'emech, as the Megillah says, to Chalil exterminate every single Jew, male and female, young and old, man and woman, Minar, Vadzak, and Tav, and Asher, children, adults, the elderly, every single person, every Jew, and to do it B'yoyim Echad, one day. And that everyone in the nation, anyone under Achashverish, is entitled and obligated to join the effort. So it's not just the army, it's everybody. And not only that, the Megillah right away begins that Achashverish ruled over 127 provinces, which means they couldn't escape to another province which was not under his tyranny. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't run. Okay, it is what it is, as they say. Anoichi haster, haster. Yeah. 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 Oh, muscle tough. Okay. By he er. Okay, may all the hastaris end as fast. May all the concealments come to an end as fast as this one. So the Gemara says, by Hebe Meach Hashverish, she was may hoidu vat kush. There's two opinions, Rav and Shmuel, either hoidu and kush were near each other or they were so far from each other. But the point is that Hashverish was called a Moshal Bekipa, meaning he was the most, he was the, the superpower of the time and all of the Jewish people were under his authority. They were subjects under the sovereignty of Achashvedish. So the decree of Achashvedish was horrendous and horrific in this sense that it was unprecedented in Jewish history. Similar to what happened with Adolf Hitler, Yamach Shabbat, who had exactly the same plan. Not in one day. And, and there were Jews living in other countries. There were millions of Jews living in the United States of America or wherever they lived, not under his domain. By Achashvedish, every Jew was under the rule of Achat, the tyranny of Achashvedish. This was the atmosphere, the reality in which Esther was plunged into. This is on a collective level. If you talk about Esther individually, even before the darkness of the decree, Esther's entire life was transformed as she was plunged into a new reality she couldn't anticipate as she was growing up as a Jewish girl. She had enough challenges before she was an orphan. She didn't have a father. She didn't have a mother. So she needed the support of Mardachai who literally raised her from childhood or infancy as a father. And as a result of that, one could already understand that Esther's life had its challenges. And then, Vatilokach, then one day she was taken. She was a It says Vatilokach. She didn't run. There was a search, and when they, they came for you, you had to go. Esther was taken, mm -hmm. and ultimately, after a year, chosen as the queen of Achashverish. This was not something she volunteered for. This was not something we can all imagine she craved or yearned for. On the contrary, this was something completely beyond her will, beyond her volition. So you can imagine, here is Esther. Esther is a great Jewish woman, Mordechai's relative. And her personal life was so uh, transformed and so turned over from one extreme to another extreme. Now she became the successor of Ashti. She became the queen of the Persian Empire. This was Esther. And as a result of that, one can maybe not appreciate, but we can begin to uh, be sensitive to the fact that the way Esther experienced this whole story was different than everybody else. Because Esther was literally in the lines that when Mordechai reaches out to her and says, go speak to Achashverosh and plead with him not to kill the Jewish people, Esther said, I can't because my husband has a decree that if you go in without permission, you go out with a head shorter. And I was not summoned for 30 days. 30 days, he's not shown any interest in seeing me. This only underscores to you what type of connection it was, what type of relationship it was. A wife goes in without permission, a wife, a queen, a queen that it says he loved and he craved for and he enjoyed her and he vachesed, so much grace, but doesn't matter, she'll also die. Just like he killed his first wife, why can't he kill his second wife? This guy has a reputation already. 
So Esther tells Mordechai, what am I going to gain if I'm going to go in? What am I going to gain? What's going to happen if I go in? I'm going to die and the Jewish people will die. At least let me stay alive. <clears throat> to appreciate what Esther was going through, let's see the next source. The Gemara says, Megillah daf tesvav amit beis. Vatamid bechatsar beis ha-melech ha-pnimis. Mordechai sent her a message. You need to go. You won't be saved in this palace. You will not be the only Jew saved. In fact, if you don't go, the Jews will be saved, but you will lose your opportunity. And then he finally said the famous words, who knows if this is not the reason you became the queen. So Esther, Esther acquiesced, and she went in, and she's standing base bechatzar in the courtyard, right that goes right before the base HaMelech HaPnim is the inner chamber of the king. Amar Ablevi, kivan she'igiyele beis ha'tzlamim nistalka imen ha'shechina. As she goes into the Beis HaTzlamim, Beis HaTzlamim means a house filled with pagan symbols. It's called Tzlamim. Tzlamim are like what we call a Tzalem, a cross, but then there was no crosses before Christianity. But Tzalem means statues, images of pagan deities that were prevalent in the Persian Empire. So it's a Beis HaTzlamim. It's a place full of Adizorah. Nistal came in a Shechina. The Shechina left her. Amra, that's when she said, Keli, Keli, Lama Azaftani. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why have you neglected me? What happened was the Tehillim, chapter 22, Chazal say that was said by Esther when she was going into Achashverish. And she didn't know if she's going to be able to make it or maybe she'll be killed immediately by the bodyguards because she's going without permission. So she knew she has to do it, but she felt a shechina with her the whole time. Esther was a sacred, a holy woman. She felt the divine presence with her. At this point, there was no Shechina anymore. So now she was not only alone physically, she was alone spiritually. She wasn't just alone in a danger zone, but she felt that she's disconnected. So she screams, Keli, Keli, Lama Zaftani. And then she said, Shema Tadon al Kemezid Val Are you going to compare? She's telling this to Hashem. Are you going to compare? Someone who does something inadvertently with someone who does something advertently. Somebody who's being coerced with somebody who does it willingly. In other words, you understand what Esther is saying? I didn't come, this is not my, I didn't choose Achashvedish. You think I want to be married to a Gentile king who's not a drunkard and a killer? And the Gemara says, Nachmelech Tippish, he was a fool too. It's not, <laughs> this is not, uh, when I graduated Beis Yaakov or whatever school they had in uh, in Iran at the time, I don't know if it was called Base Esther, I don't know what was it called, huh? <laughs> <laughs> this wasn't part of the trajectory. This wasn't the dream. This was an oinus. She was literally forced on, every, on every, every step of the way I was forced. This is a violation. This is a shaygig and it's an oinus. Why is the shechina running away from me? I understand somebody chooses to go into the abyss, somebody chooses to go into a place of filth, so they're detaching themselves, at least on a conscious level. But Esther says, you know, you know better than anybody else that this is an oinus. And that's why she screams out, Keli, Keli, Lama Zavtane. This is what the Gemara means. Esther, Vanoichi, Haster, Aster, Pane, Bayamahu. Esther lived through such a state of concealment. Besides the concealment that all the Jewish people lived through. The horrible, horrible decree of Haman. And nobody knew at the time how it's going to end. Their Jewishness came out. So everybody can understand what a darkness it was. Esther had her own unique experience of Hester, Pane, Bayamahu, because in this whole process, she couldn't even be with Jews. She couldn't even be with Mordechai. She was busy entertaining and being a companion and being a spouse and being a queen with everything that came with, everything that came with that I don't have to elaborate on, that the Gemara is intimating here. And where was she at this time? She's still busy being the dutiful queen for Ahasuerus and a very good friend of Haman because Haman was a very noble person in that family. Take a look at the words she tells Mordechai and she captures it in three words. In the next source, Mordechai tells him, If you're going to be quiet, Mordechai says to her, when she says she can't go, if you're quiet now, the Jews will be saved, but you and your father's home will be, will be lost. 
Who knows if it's not for this reason that you have reached royalty, that you have become the queen? So Esther says to Mordechai, I'll go. Gather the Jews, fast three days, I will also fast. And then she says these words. This is the fourth chapter of Megillus Esther. And thus I will come to the king, you know what means? Not according to the law. Das is like religion, the law, das. Like Das Yisrael, the laws of Israel. I will come like Kadas. This is not according to the constant, to the law. This is not protocol. And she says, V'cha'asher avadati avadati. And when they read the Megillah, most communities, these three words are read in the tone, in the notes of Eicha, which are read on Tisha B'Av. V'cha'asher avadati avadati. Unlike the rest of the Megillah, which has a festive tune to it throughout because of the nature of the story, there are a few exceptions, and one of them is here. And we can understand because the nature of the words indeed is the message of Eicha, v'chasher avadati avadati. What does it mean, chasher avadati avadati? Literally, it means, and if I'm going to be, if I, the, I was lost, I'll be lost. If this is my destiny to perish, I'll perish. Rashi says, he was saying something even more, even more intense. Rashi quotes, O Medrash Agada, Chazal say, Gemara and Medrash, Kasher avadati mi bes abba, ubad mimcha, she me achshav shani berotzi nivelis legoi ani asur lecha. It's very intense here. I already lost my father. I didn't grow up with a father. But I had you. I had you. And according to Chazal, Esther and Mardachai were married. Mardachai loy levas, says, look, Mardachai took her levas, could also be read lebayis, built a home. Now if she was forced by Achashveda, she was forced, but this was the first time she was going in willingly in order to annul the decree. Till that time, she never initiated anything. She was completely passive. Esther This was the first time Mardachai said, go, you have to go. Going with Achashveda didn't mean you go in to play dreidel with them. Or discuss some uh, interesting uh, philosophy or psychology with them. Or just drink iced coffee with, with, with a little cake. That's not what going into Achashvedish meant. So she says, this is the first time I'm going in Beratzen. Now Mordechai was the head of the Sanhedrin. He told her to do it. She said, Avadati. Now I'm going to be lost also from you. And it's, it's not just a physical loss. It's much more than that. It's a spiritual loss. And yet she's doing it. So you could appreciate. And when she goes in, the Shechina goes away. And that's why she says, how are you comparing an oinus to a ratzen? How are you comparing someone who's literally, literally this entire situation is completely beyond me? So At least... Why is it also not cold forced? Why over here is it cold willingly? She's saying herself it's not... Relative. In other words, relative. She's agreeing. Yeah, but she's unwillingly agreeing, she's saying. You're right. You're right. But so to speak, the relationship is being initiated because Achashvedas didn't summon. She's doing it because... She wants to save the Jewish people. But that, 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 that's what she meant. So she uses these words, kasher avadate avadate. Here one can sense the depth of haster aster, the depth of concealment that Esther was experiencing. And this no other Jew could feel. Even Mardechai, who was the leader of the Jewish people, he was the Sanhedrin. He was the spiritual heartbeat of the Jewish people. He never compromised his soul. He never compromised his body. He never compromised his conscience. He didn't go into a, the the De the den of darkness. He didn't have to deal with this type of this type of, of, of filth, of this type of, of, of abuse, of this type of pain. Let me call it pain, anguish. We always have to do this, like the Yael and Sisera and by, by Elliot. <laughs> What's the second one? Yael and Sisera and what else? Yehudas, yeah. <laughs> the daughters of Light, you're saying Tamar, Rus. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why I'm giving this class about the strength of women. But okay. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to feel after this class. Like, okay. <laughs> I'll just surrender more to my wife. It's fine. It's anyway a good. It's a good thing to do before the class. Also, that's what Chazal say. Kasher avadati avadati. 
is, Mela, I don't have Olam Haza. At least that Olam Haba. Now in this, I feel the Shechina is gone. So even though it's with good intentions, she felt that her Olam Haba is lost. So this is a Haster, Aster of, of, of Esther Hamalka at this moment. Hanoichi Aster, Aster. That's true. She didn't think she was doing the wrong thing. She went in. She did it with consciousness, with deliberation. But we're talking about her experience of what, what she was facing in her experience. She didn't feel guilty in the sense like, I'm ashamed, I'm doing the wrong thing, I'm so immoral. No, she, she, knew, she knew who she was. This wasn't a question. Huh? Why do you want to say that? Save the Jewish nation. But you don't save the Jewish nation after you have Harris. Mordechai didn't decide that she should be taken to the palace. But this wasn't Mordechai's choice. She was abducted by the king. Mordechai had no power on that level. This wasn't Mordechai's doing. Now she was already in the queen. She was already the queen for years. She was a queen. She became, she was married to, she became the queen of Achishraj in the seventh year of his reign. This happened five years later. So she has been in that palace for quite a few years. And even before she was officially a queen, she was there a year before, because Achashverosh had this whole system, which you could read in the Megillah about another crazy, interesting system that he had, how he chose his queens. They had to be there for a year with this type of perfume for six months, myrrh for six months, and then other perfumes another six months. And at night they came, and in the morning they left. I mean, the Megillah goes on in detail to describe, and there's a reason why the Megillah wants to describe. It's not really relevant to the story, what type of perfumes. And who was the man who ran this whole, uh, what's the word, sharem, what, what's the word, huh? harem, 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 uh, yeah, I don't know if that's the right word, that's what they say in the English Megillus, I don't know, whatever, Beis Hanoshim, and it was, it was a whole organization, it was a huge, and there was a guy, hey guy, who apparently was a very skilled guy, and he knew exactly, whatever, I got some mice, and every girl got her assistance, so it was a whole lebedic mice, why is the Megillah telling us all of this? So it, it does tell us a little bit about, it tells us a lot about Persian culture. It tells us about Achashverosh's personality. That's true. But it really tells us where Esther was going into. That's what it tells us. And a person who felt the Shechina with her, now she herself says, Keli, Keli, Lama Azavtani. She turns to Hashem, why did you abandon me? What did you abandon? And it's at this moment where we come to really appreciate the true depth and the true essence of who Esther was and what the Megillah represents, yeah, in Persian culture and in many other cultures. The woman didn't have any of these rights, certainly not to influence her children and mentor them and guide them. She herself was completely subservient to the husband. And you see that the whole reason to execute Vashti is because Mamuchan told Achashvedish that people, women, are going to learn from Vashti not to listen to their husbands. And that freaked out Achashverosh and everybody else, and he had to kill Vashti for that. It's interesting. I mean, interesting. Quite tragic. And then you see that Esther was worried that if she walks in, she doesn't do anything. She walks in without permission, and he doesn't extend his scepter. Achaz das elahamis. You get killed right away. The security was so intense, the paranoia was so profound, that even your own queen, who you said you're crazy about her, and he was, it's obvious from the Megillah, from all the women who came, Esther was the choice. Nonetheless, doesn't matter. Esther herself could feel so insecure that she's going to die. At the end, she didn't. He extended the scepter. This all explains to us, a little bit at least, to give us a taste of the emotional and spiritual concealment and adversity and darkness that Esther was facing. But what actually happened? What really happens here? What does Esther reveal in all of this? And this is the uniqueness of Esther. Esther says, Keli, Keli, Loma Azaftani. Why have you abandoned me? The question is, was she abandoned? Was she neglected? She was not abandoned. Not only that, she saved the entire Jewish nation. Because of this woman, the entire nation was saved. Because what happened is, she went into Achashverosh. He said, what do you want, Esther? At Chatzia Malchus, half of the kingdom I'll give you. And Esther says, all I want is a nice party. Make sure there's a lot of good wine. Not, not a big deal. One party, what do you want at the party? He asks her, I want a second party. At the second party, that's when she spills the beans. And that's when she discloses the truth that she's a Jew and that her entire nation will be annihilated because of the decree of the king. 
and that's when the king executes and has Haman hung on the gallows. And the story continues, the rest is history, as they say, where the Jewish people give, are given the right for self-defense. A year later, Yud Gimel Adar, it's transformed into a day of victory and triumph, which is celebrated till today with Purim. How did Esther do this? So Esther, fascinatingly, first she was scared, ambivalent, passive, how can I do this? And then when Mordechai empowered her and said, Mi yideyem leis kazoisi gat lamalchus, suddenly in a moment's notice, a woman who would look before, like meek, she didn't even say anything. The Gemara says that Esther was a very, very quiet person. The Megillah says, Loi magedes, she didn't talk. She didn't say anything, nobody knew who she was. She had that nature, she seemed very passive and meek. And suddenly, in a moment's call, this human being was transformed not just into a leader, but she literally, brilliantly strategized a situation where she had her husband wrapped, wrapped, <laughs> and Haman, Akshayesh and Haman, suddenly were completely falling prey to this strategy that she created. She invited them to a party, Haman and Akshayesh she invited to the party. Because this wasn't just a party. This was a party in which she needed to make her husband feel that there's something going on with Haman. The worst thing, this was Esther's brilliance, knowing her husband so well, she knew the worst thing that can happen to him is if Haman, whose entire power was that he was protecting the king, if Haman is now proven to be not only not loyal, but someone who's ready to betray the king in the most intimate space, Esther knew this is what he had to do. So what happens? She's uh, very innocent. No one realizes. Even when we read the Megillah, we don't realize her brilliance. That's how, it, that's how brilliant it is. The Megillah doesn't say what she did. You have to figure it out. She just tells Akashver, can you please come to a party with Haman? Now imagine a husband, a uh, wife asks her husband, you know, it's our 25th wedding anniversary. Let's go out. But you know what? Do me a favor. You know, bring the CEO of your company also. 25th anniversary. At the first party, in the middle of drinking, the king says, what do you want, Esther? She says, another party. And bring the CEO again. No, if you were Achashverish, if I was Achashverish, what would I be thinking? I don't like this. That night he doesn't sleep. Of course he doesn't sleep. Why do you think he doesn't sleep? I also wouldn't sleep. <laughs> Nobody realizes Esther's brilliance. She didn't say anything. I'm inviting two friends. Friends? I'm your husband. Haman, second time? And there's one detail in the Megillah where Esther nails it. And here you see it. The first time she tells Achashvedesh, please, Yavay HaMelech Haman, let HaMelech and Haman come to the Mishtash Sisi Loi, the feast that I prepared for the, for the king. At the, at the feast, he says, what do you want? She says, tomorrow, Yavay HaMelech Vahaman La Mishtash Sisi Lohem, the feast that I made for both of you. The first day she made it for her husband. The second day she made it for both. One little word in the Megillah. Lo ilahem. Achashverish couldn't sleep that night. He went completely crazy. This is how Achashverish created the fertile ground. I mean Esther created the fertile ground to be able to do the Makkah to be able to deliver a punch and make sure that nobody recovers from that punch. Somebody once said if you're going to confront a lion you know, make sure you kill him. You don't just beat him. At the moment. Because if he's coming back, he's coming back. Esther knew she has one chance. And indeed at the second meal, when she said, he is the man who wants me annihilated. Achashvedish was already so suspicious towards Haman. And then when he came back and he saw Haman on the bed, this nailed the deal and this was over. This was all on one level. A very practical, brilliant, strategic level where Esther did her thing. Nobody knew what she was doing. Nobody can imagine it. Nobody can plan it. And there's many more details how she strategizes it so perfectly to the point that there's no, Achashverish is not relinquishing himself and Haman is not relinquishing himself from this one. On a spiritual level, she's the one who told Mordechai, go gather the Jews and fast for three days. So she says, Keli, Keli, Lama Azaftani. She felt that the Shechina departed from her. But the Shechina didn't depart from her for a moment. Proof is in the pudding. And that's exactly the whole Chiddush of Esther. The Chiddush of Esther is that there comes moments in life where a person could say, Keli, Keli, Lama, Zaftani, and it's recorded in Torah. 
That means it's not just fiction. It's not just Esther's imagination. She's having a bad day. The Torah records, Kaili, Kaili, Lama Zaftani, because in the conscious experience, you're completely alone. You're completely isolated. And that's why Hashem's name is not even once in the Megillah. Not even once. If Hashem's name would be in the Megillah, you're missing the whole story. The story of the Megillah, the word Megillah means, Megillah comes from the word Gilui, reveal. The word Esther means concealment. Megillah's Esther is a paradox. The revelation of concealment. And that was Esther's uniqueness. What Esther showed was, that in the Anoichi Haster Aster, in the ultimate concealment that a person sometimes goes through, as the Baal Shem Tev said, Anoichi Haster Aster, even in the Hester Aster, the Hastara, Betay Hastara, Anoichi, I am there. But not the I that has a name. Anoichi doesn't have a name. I is deeper than names. The name is that which is manifested, projected. I know you by your name, by your name, by your aura, by your halo, by your reputation. By your radiance, that's the shame. Anoichi is the core. The Zoya has an expression, Anoichi misha Anoichi. I am who I am. The lo Yisram is lo Yishamayis v'kaitz. It's not intimated in a letter or even in a little line. Why? Because the core essence is beyond description, beyond definition. All I can, I can give a name to things that I can define. Things I can't define doesn't have a name. So the Anoichi, Haster, Haster is not the Anoichi that has a name. It's a noichi that's nameless because it's deeper than a name. Like a noichi, a noichi, and then a noichi is Hashem and Elekecha. That the noichi should become Hashem Elekecha, your consciousness. Keli, Keli, Lama Azaftani, Keli is a name. Like we said in Tehillim Nun Beis, Kel Chesed Kolayai. So in that moment when you're experiencing Azaftani, the Megillah has no name. In fact, when you read the Megillah and you don't have any background and any context, what are you reading about? You're reading about Achashverosh, you're reading about Vashti, you're reading about searching for women, you're reading about the perfumes they were giving them, you're reading about Bixen Vaseresh, assassination attempt, you're reading about Haman, you're reading about Haman's intrigues. It's a whole story about Persian culture and a Persian palace and a Persian empire, and everything in the Megillah happens according to the trajectory of nature, Teva. As it says in Sephardim, there's not one moment in the Megillah where you could say, oh, the sea split, or the water turned into blood, or God came down, or Hashem came down on Mount Sinai. Every moment in the Megillah, in other words, if you look at the Megillah, what would you say? You could say, you know, it's a nice story. The first lady was Jewish. She was a brilliant woman. She was much more active than we realized. She was much smarter than we realized. She wasn't as meek and as passive as people thought. She was quiet. But her inner world was quite rich and glorious. And the Jews had a mazel. But where was there something unnatural? She got her husband on her side. She got Haman. She got Haman, she got Hashverish, Haman paranoid against Haman. That's it. It's all alpiteva. It's all alpi nature. Aster, aster. Even the miracle is concealed in many ways. What does Esther teach? Esther showed and teach that in that moment of Lama Zaftani, she possessed the mission and the inner knowledge and awareness that even when I feel I'm alone, I'm not alone. And the fact, sometimes when I feel I'm alone, that's the, that's the deepest connection. Because now, it's not that Hashem is with me, assisting me. I don't feel anything. It's that Esther herself becomes an embodiment of the Shekhinah. Esther herself, like Shluchai Shaladam Kamaisei, the Shliach becomes like the person who sent that Shliach. Esther herself takes the initiative and she runs the show, and that is Hashem working through Esther. And this is what gave Esther the power that even when you could feel Lama Zaftani, she knew now I have to look deep into myself and know that the entire divine infinite energy is in my soul, it's in my heart, it's embedded in my guf and my neshama. I will say, I'm subjecting myself to things that are alien to every Ehrlich Yiddish Efray, to any, to any moral person, I'm subjecting myself to this. In other words, I'm involved in a situation, taka not by choice, by oinus. But there's a situation which would, should cast me into darkness, should cast me into depression, should cast me into abuse, should cast me into a sense of, of, of uh, de- dejection. 
make me feel wretched, make me feel wretched, make me feel so unworthy, so unclean, so immoral. Esther's biggest chiddush was that she found the anoichi in the haster aster pane bayemahu, and never for a moment did she doubt Mardukai's words, mi yoideyem leis kazois higat lamalchos, that this was the ultimate divine mission to be able to take the worst darkness and transform it into light and reveal that ein oid mulvadoi means even in such a place, even in such a situation, even in a place vadati avadati, that's maybe my feeling. The reason it's my feeling is because my mission is to go into a place of darkness that nobody else can go. So dark that you could think, I lost everything. I lam hazamit, I lam haba with my morality, with my holiness, with my gdusha, and the shchidna, and azaftani. And she showed that right there, she brought the light of Einoid Malvade, the light of Achtus Hashem, the light of oneness, in that situation. So Mardechai inspired, Mardechai mentored, Mardechai initiated, Mardechai was a backbone, Mardechai was a support, no question. But who's the one who faced the adversity? Mardechai remained always connected to heaven. He never left. He didn't have to. Yes, he faced the darkness, he dealt with the darkness, but his soul remained anchored in heaven. Mordechai never said, V'chasher avadati avadati. Mordechai never said, Keli, Keli, lama zavtani. Who is the one who went into that place, who was, not because she wanted to, but she was taken there. And she could have easily been lost. And in that moment of being lost, instead of being lost, her soul, her divinity triumphed. And not only that, she changed the whole, all of history. That's Esther. Who is the one who actually had the mysterious nefesh? To walk into the chamber where you can come out dead. And going into a place where spiritually you feel dead, even if you don't come out dead. That's Mesiris Nefesh. In a way, it's a deeper Mesiris Nefesh for Esther. The spiritual Mesiris Nefesh, in a way, is much deeper for Esther than the physical Mesiris Nefesh. Or certainly both are very, very significant and profound. This was Esther. So now when the miracle happens, what does Esther say? Esther says, Kavuni ledoiris, kasvuni ledoiris. And she uses the word me, establish me for generations. And write me for generations. Not only a yomtif, but a yomtif in which we read the story, a yomtif in which we write down the story and we read it from the writing and we make it a Megillah Esther, a Megillah that doesn't have Hashem's name. Because this is Esther's entire accomplishment. You look at a book, you're reading about Vashti, you're reading about Homan, you're reading about Akashverish, you're reading about Psalmim, Tamruke, Hegai, this character, that character. Everything about Persian culture, Jews suddenly have to start reading about Persian culture for chapter after chapter after chapter till we get to the highlight of the story and Hashem is not given credit once. Whose Megillah is this? This is Megillah's Esther. Esther takes that situation. There's no shame Hashem, there's no Hashem's name. And she transforms it into Torah. She transforms it into Torah Shabbat And she transforms it into Tanakh. And Jews read it every year and say it every year. What, and, and read it in Aksav every year. It's not just in words, it's also in writing. And it's a Yom Tif. Why did Esther do this? Because Esther was teaching here the ultimate powerful lesson that in the deepest moments of, a, of what per, is perceived as abandonment and darkness, when I'm screaming, Kaylee, Kaylee, Lama Zaftani, you should know your power is to make Megillah from Esther. The Vanoichi Aster, Aster Pane Bayema, who is the ability of Esther to hold on and to reveal that Achashverish and Haman and Bixen Vaserish and Vashti and the palace and everything. As the Medrash says, Achashverish is a combination of three words. Acharis, Vereshis, Shaloi. The beginning and the end is his. At the surface, it looks like Achashverish. Esther reveals what's concealed inside Achashverosh. What's concealed in every situation is Esther will not let go of the light and the truth and the authenticity and the divinity and the holiness and therefore know that even in this situation she is not only guided and directed but she becomes the manifestation and the shliach, the shlucha of Hashem in this world and therefore for a single moment she will not divert and get lost and, and descend into despondency 
and look in the mirror and feel so immoral on the contrary. Esther realizes that her mission took her to very dark places because she has the power to be able to reveal such light and such darkness. And that's why she says, Leo is Lila Shame. Leo is Lila Shame. I want to have a name here. This should be my name. And we asked, what's the meaning of this? Why is Esther asking for this? First of all, there's the element of her name, Esther. Leah's Lila Shame. It's my name, Megillus Esther. I want people to know about this name and the significance of this name and the mission that's carried in this name. I want people to understand the story of what's happening here. The story of a woman who goes into such places and doesn't only come out triumphant, but literally saves the day and becomes a timeless source of light and inspiration and salvation to create the happiest day in the, the happiest day in the calendar, Purim. Esther also, as you said earlier, is sending a message to every Jewish woman and every Jewish girl. Since that day, there's Mordechai, and Mordechai helped and mentored and inspired and guided as a member of the Sanhedrin and her own relationship with Mordechai. But realize that the actual salvation of the Jewish home, the Jewish family, the Jewish community, and the Jewish world came through a woman. She had that courage, that know-how, that power, that resilience, that clarity, that decisiveness to be able to go into such a place and not only not falter and not only not get defeated on every level, but on the contrary, to remain etched in eternity, in holiness, in godliness, and therefore know that this is a mission and the darkness is here for me to transform into light. But Reb Tzadik HaKoyen of Lublin, he was one of the great Hasidic masters, Reb Tzadik HaKoyen of Lublin, passed away in 1900. He has a sefer called Resise Laila. Resise Laila. And uh, it's the wet drops of the night, Resise Laila, the water droplets of the night. Futsoy say Resise Laila from a song and song that says, my hair braids are resise laila. They're moist with the wetness of the night. So there, chapter 52, Eisnon Beis, he gives one deeper, one more aspect in this story of why Esther said, my name. I want everybody to know my name. And he lived in the 1800s. So this is not something that was written a year ago or a few months ago. It was written in the 1800s. But when I saw it the first time, I think it was last week I saw it, or two, whatever I saw recently, I, I was startled, beyond startled for a moment that he says this. And I, I, want, I, want, I, want us to see, I want us to see this inside. He raises the question, the big question we asked last week. What's this idea that on Purim you become intoxicated? Adelayada, you don't know the difference between blessed is Haman, blessed. Oh yeah, I'm already drunk. Blessed is Mardukai and cursed is Haman. Okay, that's that's a Purim slip. Not a Freud, it's not a Freudian slip, it's a Purim slip. What's this idea? Jews, we're not, we don't like intoxication. The Gemara says that a shikr, it's called an abomination to be drunk. You're not allowed to daven when you're drunk. It's, 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 it's something considered very disgraceful. On Purim, suddenly it's an obligation, and we learned last week, Rav said it's an obligation, and Rabbi and Abzeda got drunk, and the whole story that happened by the party. What's this whole idea? So this is what he explains here. It's the third paragraph from the bottom. Purim represents the depth of the relationship between the soul and Hashem. Even in the deepest concealment in the own person's life, in the depth of one's heart, you're always in dvekus. You're always connected. That's Pshat Adalayada. A person gets drunk, it's a metaphor. A person loses their mind, they lose their mind, they're drunk. 
So let's hear the words again. You have to get drunk till you don't know the difference between cursed as Haman and blessed as Mardukai. Most people interpret it, you're so drunk, you don't know the difference. Reb Tzadok HaKoyin of Lublin says it means something else. It means exact opposite. <laughs> and I actually saw this from the Balatanya in Tovkov Samach Gimel from 1803. It says as follows. You should get so drunk. The difference between Haman and Mardachai is not based on knowledge. It comes from a place that's deeper than knowledge. In other words, sometimes the difference between Haman and Mardachai is because I know it. I understand it. Come on, this is Haman, this is Mardachai. How do you compare the avoid of Purim is when I go into a place of Adalayada. It's not that I know between Arhaman and Baruch Mardechai. Rather, the core of my soul screams out the difference between Arhaman and Baruch Mardechai. The way he puts it here is, person is drunk like light. He doesn't know what's happening. What does that represent in life? There's a place that my intellect, if you go to my, the core of my conscious, beyond intellect, we call pre-verbal, pre-cognitive. What comes out then? What comes out then is that Arur Haman and Baruch Mardachai. Adela Yoda, the difference is not based on Yoda. You don't know between Arur Haman and Baruch Mardachai. It's much deeper than Yoda. In other words, it's visceral, it's intrinsic, it's innate, it's essential. It's the quintessence of the person. So we're not worried what happens when all the layers go away, even Das, even when my Das shuts down. I don't have an ego, I don't have the power to discriminate, to dissect. It's not mathematical anymore, it's Layoda. But the relationship is essential. Why? Because in the deepest concealment, there's still dveikos. That's Adelayad. That's the entire holiness of Purim. And that's why it's a yamtiv that can never ever be severed. It says that even La'asad love, when all the holidays will be obliterated, it will be like candle in the sunlight. Purim will never be nullified. Chazal say. Why? So he says, this is the pshat. Purim represents something that could never, ever be nullified. Everything else could be nullified because if it's based on my conscious awareness or connection, so if it's not there, it's not there. But since Purim represents the essential relationship, the essential holiness, the essential dvekas, so then nothing I can do or anybody can do can destroy it. Even if I go into concealment. And even if, not like Esther, I go in chas v'sholom berot. In other words, I'm drunk. I'm completely drunk. In other words, I go into places that are very difficult, challenging. What Purim represents is that the relationship is at the core. If it's at the core, your soul is divine at the core, so then nothing I can do or anybody else can do can ever sever it. I can eclipse it. Aster, aster. Maybe a double eclipse, a double uh, concealment. A lunar eclipse, a solar eclipse, but it's an eclipse. And when I get past that, I'll find our Naichi. So that's why Purim could never be nullified, because nothing could nullify such a relationship. And that's what Esther wanted. She is the one who made it to her generations. This lesson. And he says here, Rashi Pidish, shame, Leos Lila shame. Rashi Pidish Sham, Leos Lila shame, but Vader like Kivna la Hagdal Kvaida Baza. Did Esther want to grace or make her covet big? Everybody thought, Esther, Esther, Esther. She wanted to be a celebrity. She wanted to be promoted. I want a name. I want thousands of years later. People should say, Esther, Esther, Esther. Yay, hooray, Esther. Megillus Esther. He says, that's not Pshat. So what did she want? What was it that she wanted? So he says now, the next paragraph, he says some very, very intense words. I'm going to read it fast and translate and then summarize. The name of Esther means the presence of the Shechina that is concealed. In other words, even when it's Haster Aster and you don't see any name of Hashem, to know that the Shechina is in exile with the Jewish people, in the impurity. It says in Chumash. And there's nothing chaitzit, there's nothing that could be chatzitza. There's no chatzitza that can separate between the Shechina and the presence of you, the presence of the person. Even somebody who was taken to the home of a Gentile. 
Umelech Adir Kazeh, and such a powerful king and tyrant. Veniva Loiloi Kam upon him. And there was intimacy. There was a physical relationship, and not once, but many times between her and this Gentile. Veyoldomimenu. If that's not enough, she gave birth from him. So it's not just some physical connection. There was a birth from it. Sometimes she gets out of it. No, she stayed in his house forever. Not forever, but she stayed there consistently. She couldn't leave home the next day. Nobody came to save her. She stayed there. If this is not enough, it was a place of pagan deities. A base hatslamim. Hayesh tumagdoilamiza. When a person looks in the mirror, such a woman looks in the mirror, says, Is there more tumma than any person ever experienced? Sir so Tzaddik says, This is the question. Is there more tumma? Is there more shame, impurity, filth? Ve'im kolza, but what's the truth? He bitzitkasach, bitzitkasach, mitchila vatsayf peshava. She remains in her tzitkas, she remains in her righteousness from the beginning till the end equally. Nothing of her Kedusha was changed at all. Not only that, Chazal say, the Ruach HaKodesh came back to her when she went into the house of Tuma. Who ever heard of this? Hashem told Moshe, I can't speak to you in Egypt because it's full of Abedzah. Let's go outside of the city. Esther accomplished. She goes into the base of Tuma, for Tuma. And the Ruach HaKodesh comes into her. And not a moment was her holiness compromised, and she knew this. What is this about? At that moment, Esther initiated a new energy in history. And she demonstrated through her life that the Kedusha of Knesset Yisrael is of such that no purity in the world can contaminate it at all. Esther embodied it in the most visceral and conscious way. I could be thrown into everything. I was thrown into it. I was sent there. My holiness was not compromised. She knew it. Not only that, Ruach HaKodesh was vibrating in her at those very moments. Why? Because I was sent here. Who sent me? Hashem. In other words, I am just the ray of infinity that was sent here. I am infinite consciousness having an impure experience. Think about that. She's having an impure experience. I am infinite. In other words, who's having the impure experience? Kivayachal? Hashem. Does Hashem become impure by coming into the impure world? He doesn't become impure. Why not? Why not? Why not? And he describes here, forgive me, but he describes here very vividly what we're talking about. In his house, with the connection, with birth, staying there, with the tzlamim. Where do you get more tumor than this? It's not a one-time event even. Even a one-time event. It's not a one-year event. It went on for years and years. And she knew her kedusha wasn't compromised a bit. What, what was this? This is Esther. This nobody can compare to. Mardachai was a gewaldic yid. <laughs> he was the holiest of holy, but he remained in kedusha. He gave directives from the Beis Medrash. He was surrounded by Svarim. He wasn't surrounded by Tzlomim. Mordechai lived a holy life. Esther, if you looked at her from the outside and you didn't know who she was, you're saying, wow, <laughs> when she writes her story, we're going to hear about how much shame and impurity she's dealing with. But Esther knew that's not, that's not the case. I'm a manifestation of the divine. This is Hashem's experience through me. What did she bring to the world? A whole new energy, a whole new truth. What's the truth? That I am simply living out and bringing out the truth of Knesset Yisrael. Not everybody feels like Esther. Most people don't feel like Esther. Because she knew the truth. <laughs> because it's the truth. She wasn't, she wasn't affected by the circumstances. She never doubted herself. She never said, I'm so impure because I'm full of shame, because I'm full of dirt. Of course I deserve this. I'm a nobody. She never knew that. She knew who she was. But obviously, Mardachai put a lot into her. Mardachai gave it to her, and he told her those key words. 
Mi yo ideya im la esko zoi sigat la malchus. That itself is part. That cry itself is part of the relationship. You understand what I'm saying? The cry itself, Lama Zaftani, is the relationship because it's, it's not that she wasn't in a place of darkness. She was in a place of darkness. And in that place of darkness, I don't feel. And in that not feeling, she had to feel the pain. And that's why she can bring the light into the darkness. If she didn't feel the Zaftani, it's almost like, you know, you're like, I'm a little aloof, I'm a little detached. She was not aloof, she was not detached. She went into that place. And nonetheless, when she said, Keli, Keli, Lama Zaftani, the Gemara says, Ruach HaKodesh came back to her. How? Because that itself meant, I refuse to believe that I'm alone. I know I'm not alone. Einoid Mulvadoi. This is all you, through me. Now you'll ask, but didn't Esther ask a question? Why me? Such beautiful jobs. Give somebody else. <laughs> beautiful stuff. Yeshikoyach. Thanks, but no thanks. Right? What does Tuvia say? God, I know we're the chosen people. Maybe you could choose somebody else once in a while. <laughs> Very nice. I was chosen. Gavaldic. I'm resilient. Maybe you could choose somebody else. Mardechai understood this, and that's why Mardechai told her two words, Mi Oideya. Who knows? Those two words are strange. Mardechai should have said, when you want to convince somebody to go on a mission that basically can spell the end of their life, you have to be confident. Right? A commander-in-chief sending his soldiers to, Norm- to Normandy, or uh, a commander sending soldiers into Gaza, if I'm ambivalent, eh, I don't know, do I need you? Eh, maybe we don't need you. Who knows? Who knows? Maybe, we, maybe you're here. F- you don't say who knows. You say I know. Echad mi yoideya. Echad. Ani yoideya. Ani yoideya. Ki la eis kazoi sigat la malchus. I know. Say God knows. Hashem knows. He says mi yoideya. Who knows? The meaning is really, he was saying something much deeper. He was saying, Esther, I have the same questions. This is something that's higher than Das. Mi Oideya. The journey of every soul is not something you'll be able to capture intellectually. With my Das, I say, oh, this is the trajectory of my life. This is how my children are going to come out. This is what my marriage is going to look like. This is what I'm going to look like. The journey of a life, what do we say in the morning? Ashreinu matoiv chalkeinu umanoyim goiroleinu. What's a goiro? A goiro, by definition, looks like it's random. Why did you win the Gairal and I lost the Gairal? It's Gairal. What's my Noyim Gairal and how pleasant my Gairal is? What really looks like a Gairal is not random. It's Lamayla Min Hadas. It's a relationship that I can't control through intellect. Mordechai empowered Esther with those words. He said, Esther, you want to be successful? This is the way. Mi Yodeya. This is a place, trust me, beyond Das. Why you, how you, what's the Cheshben? I don't know. God created intellect. He's beyond intellect. Truth is beyond intellect. Infinity is beyond intellect. So who was the first person to observe the mitzvah of Adela Yada? Esther. Esther. Adela Yada doesn't come from a vacuum. Oh, get drunk till you don't know what hit you. No. Adela Yada is the deepest avoida. Adela Yada is much harder than drinking. <laughs> I know a lot of people can drink. I'm looking for people who can do Adela Yada. Adela Yada is not, I dr- I'm drunk. Adela Yada means, can I go into a place in my soul that doesn't have to control life through understanding and remain fully present? Because when I do, I'm a channel for infinity. I'm not finite anymore. The moment Esther went into me, idea. Now, it's not about questions. You have good questions. I have better questions. You have even better questions. Esther realized that the soul's mission is sometimes beyond what we call explicable and explainable. Not because it's not my mission, because it touches me in the deepest place, even deeper than my seichel, than what my brain can formulate and make into a model that is constricted and restricted so that my brain should understand it. I don't want to do that. (laughs) Infinity, you can't put into that. Because Esther had that power that Mardachai gave her, she can go to those places without an ego. 
without guilt, without shame, without insecurity, without fear. Usually I go to these places, I'm such a bad person, I'm such a bad girl, Shem is punishing me. How much Gehenim am I going to get? Kasher avadati avadati, that's it, I'm done, I'm finished, I'm a lost case. Esther realized this is a place beyond reward, beyond what you can understand. This is a place of vadati, of vadati, of complete bittal. There was no metzias anymore. There was no ego anymore. That's kasher vadati, of vadati. Who is here? I'm just, I'm mamisha channel. Those are the moments we become the most powerful people, the most creative people, because you don't take things personal. There's no ego involved. It's not guilt. It's not fear. It's not insecurity. It's not shame. It's not about... Adelayada in a most healthy way. Adelayada means I don't have to figure it out because my eye is deeper than figuring things out. My eye is a channel for the divine eye. And as a result of that, yeah, yeah you see. You're saying about Tilbash Esther Malchus. Beautiful. It's true. That's the, right after Mordechai says those words on the third day. It's about Tilbash Esther Malchus. She, uh, she, uh, what's the word? Dawns. She dawns herself with royalty. Yeah, this woman who seemed meek suddenly changes everything. But the Malchus is not just royal clothing or a royal demeanor. It was an inner core of, I'm not a victim to impurity. I am a queen. A Malchus. A queen is not a victim. A queen is not a subject. A Malchus. What does it mean, a Malchus? That this experience, which is the most impure experience from a Jewish perspective, as Riptzadik described, I'm still Malchus. I'm not a victim of it. So how did I end up here? This is the mission of my soul to real, bring out the Chiddush in history that is brought out now for the first time. That in the lowest, lowest, lowest situations that I may face, I remained fully, fully divine. I remained fully, fully pure. I remained fully, fully embodied with that invincibility, even if consciously I may have not always felt it. In fact, maybe I have felt like the worst, worst, worst person. That was only my yada. My la yada. If you could take an x-ray of my soul, my soul was always, always invincible. So Reb Tzadah comes and says this. Leois lila shame. I want everybody to know my name. Listen to this. And it's going to be hard to say. One of the hardest things for victims of such type of relationships, one of the hardest things for them to do is to speak and not to come out with their name. Even today in Israel, after October 7th, people know, those who want to know, know what happened. And it's still hard to get women to speak because the depth of shame is overwhelming. And this is true also about boys and men. I love that you have boys who went through stuff, who were violated, and sometimes 30, 40, 50 years, they don't say a word. They don't say a word. The level of shame is indescribable. Th- those who don't understand won't understand. It's not your fault. Why are you so embarrassed? It's not a rational thing. It is so deep. The level of shame is so deep that the person doesn't even want to tell themselves it happened. And that's why many people don't speak because they don't even know. It's a pre-verbal experience. They don't want to tell themselves it happened. If they can find any other interpretation, they will give other interpretations. With girls and women, it's even more powerful because of the natural sensitivity and refinement. But this is true about all people. And you know what Esther Amalka was doing? Leah is Leah Shame. I want everybody to know my name. I'm going to write down the story. Anyone who reads the Megillah sees the story. I was taken to the king. This is the first victim in history, a woman who emerged and said, this is me, this is my name, this is my story, let everybody know my name, what happened to me? I wasn't sitting in my beautiful city, in my beautiful house, cooking for Shabbos and Yom Tif, learning, davening, saying to Hillem, Tzena or Rena, cooking sourdough challah, baking sourdough challah, sorry. You see how much I know about Sawadoh Chala. This is the story of Esther. 
Why did Esther want this? Leo is still shame. Not anybody else's name. My name. I'm putting myself on the line. This is me. Everybody forever is going to know what was done to me. And I never went back to the Jewish people. I never went back to build a family after Purim. And I think that's also an element of Leah's Lila Shem. As you said before, Esther didn't have a regular Jewish family. The son that she gave birth to remained a Persian king, Daryavish. Yeah. So Esther says, at least when people, Megillah says, Esther, you're my family. Every Jewish woman, every Jewish girl, every Jew, every Jewish man and boy, is, this is my family. I saved you. I gave everything up to save you. You're my family. This is my name. I don't have another name. Yeah. Leah is Leah Shame. This is my name. But why, is she, why does she want her name to be publicized? To give every such person courage. People live for dozens of years with self-blame, self-shame. That is indescribable. It's unfathomable the depth of shame that people live with. And why? They were violated for heaven's sake. It's not that they chose it. But the shame is not rational because I'm a bad girl. It's the poison of abuse that gets ingested in the psyche of people and suddenly they're eating themselves up morally, emotionally with anxiety and self-loathing and blame that turns their entire world into darkness. So Esther comes out and says, My name. This is a story of tremendous pain that I went into. But I want you to know the second part of the story. For a moment, I did not doubt myself. For a moment, I did not think... I wasn't anything but holy. For a moment, I wasn't in a place where I could completely fall into the spirit. Not because I couldn't. Not because I didn't have the thoughts. Not because I didn't say, Keli, Keli, Lama, Zaftani. But Esther became the embodiment of what it means to believe in your soul and to know that the infinity of your soul is so divine and so powerful that in the midst of all the darkness, it is present feeling the pain viscerally and yet, yet, having the ability, and it's, an, it's inexplicable, it's Adelayada, to be able to see that somehow this is a divine experience, which means ultimately I am not a victim of anyone's darkness. I am on a journey to create light and love and redemption in our world. That's me, Esther, the epitome of concealment who never believe that the concealment is absolute. Never. Leo is Leela Shame. This is the name. Everyone should know my name. Yes, you could talk about my story. You could tell my story. I know it's not the story that every Jewish girl wants to get up and say about herself. We learned the sanitized version. Huh? We learned the sanitized version. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's finish his last words here. Let's listen to the, 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 the second to the last paragraph, the last three lines. This was the whole purpose of taking Esther to the house of Achashverish. Hashem could have found other ways. He could have had Bixen and Seresh kill Achashverish. <laughs> he could have had Haman have a stroke. Stalin had a stroke, Purim time, 1953. It had to come this way. Says Reb Tzadik, Esther was the bureau. She is the one who, who clarified, who demonstrated this truth in the world through her embodied experience. This is the whole Indian. Levarer Dover Zesh, Gdushas Yemea Purim, Shenizgala Oz Ur Zedik Dushas Yisro, Shekol Tin Neufus Loitinat Tanfe. Esther revealed this light of Kedushas Yisro that all Tin you know what Tin is? All garbage, excrement, filth, Loitinatanfe never made you dirty. It made me feel I'm dirty. It made me think I'm dirty. It may cause me to live with a sense of inner dirt. But it's a matter of perception that I could heal. And how do I heal it? First and foremost, by knowing it's a perception. 
There's nothing at any point that can prevent you from touching infinite holiness. The gam kielech begait salmovis lo yiruraki ate imadi da filu yiu b'mokim sheyiu dvukim bayis barach. There's no place I can be in physically or mentally that you say there's no dvekas there. You're a lost case. You're disconnected. You made so many mistakes. You did this. You did that. Even when I'm not on the level of Esther. Esther embodied this for the Jewish people. She revealed the truth of every Jew. By Esther, it came out in the most conspicuous way. You see what light she brought to the world. If somebody says Esther was full of tumma, Esther was full of filth, Esther nebach is nebach, nebach, the word you don't associate with Esther is nebach. Esther, that's what I want you to know. I'm not a nebach. Leo is lila shame. I don't look at Purim as a Nebuch case. I'm the one who made it a holiday. I'm the one who wrote the Megillah. I'm the one who said to read the Megillah. Esther Shur said, you know what? It happened next. Let's move on. Make another holiday. Let's go back to Shavuos. We'll go to the lasagna. I don't need Hamantash. Esther is the one who made it. She could have looked at herself and said, you know what? This is not such a Geshmaka story. But what do you see? What Esther said? No. This is the story where there was no Tum at all. In the Kaili, Kaili, Lama Zaftani, she real, 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 ain, oid, malvadoi, even in this place. Why? She demonstrates what Kedusha Yisrael is, Adelayad. Even when I get to a place beyond the other, what's going to come out? The truth is going to come out. And even the person, he's like light. He's shikha like light. What's going to come out for real? Sometimes I think I was in a crazy place. I was addicted. I was pulled into these things. Not like Esther. I'm a yada. What's going to really come out is the truth can't be changed. The truth can't be, can't, can't be averted. So now he finishes. We'll just finish with this paragraph. It says in Tehillim, They have seen at the edges of the earth the salvation of God. So Moses says, when did they see at the edges of the earth Hashem's salvation? Times of Mardachai and Esther. What does it mean the edges of the earth? So he says, Afseyaritz means the lowest dregs of the earth is God present. If I end up in the lowest places, is Hashem present? If I end up in places where my body or soul are violated, is God there? Did God watch it? Did my soul watch it? Was I connected? You can't tell me I was. Look what it did to me. Look how much craziness and sanity I'm dealing with. Look how much anxiety and depression I'm dealing with. Look how much blame, shame, guilt, addiction I'm dealing with. Look what it did to my marriage. Look what it did, look what it did to my emotional life. Rochel Afse Yaretz. When was Elokus revealed in Afse? In the lowest places, like in the house of Achashvedish, in the time of Mordechai and Esther, the Hoya Hayoiser Rosha. First of all, he was a Rosha Merusha Achashvedish. And she ends up in his room, in his bedroom. There the Yeshua of Elekeno was seen. The miracle could have been destroy Achashvedish and liberate the Jewish people from him. That's not what happened. He remains the king after the story. After Purim, he became even more powerful. So I don't understand. You're saving the Jewish people, how? By keeping Achashverosh intact, in his position, even more powerful. Very emotional words. He, had, he was given the permission to put his Zuama. You know what Zuama is? Filth, uncleanliness, zuhama. We're into a woman, a Jewish woman, and such a woman, such a tzaddikis. What's the story here? And after Purim, it didn't change. She was still a queen by him. Aval hakoy lefarsim Yeshua selekenu digam shamhu amanig ve'ein oid malvadei klal. This is the whole chiddush of Esther. The whole chiddush of Esther was how she experienced it. Esther says. My mission is to teach the truth that Ein Oid Malvadoi means even in the house of Achashverosh. And even in a situation that seems stripped from any level of holiness, from any level of connectivity, and the natural response should be, I am contaminated, I am filthy, I am dirty. 
What Esther reveals is that ain't oid mulvadai. There is a real thing to hold on to. The invincibility of the soul is so powerful. And I'll prove it, Esther says. See that the whole Yehudim vikar came through this. What does this mean? What is Esther teaching? Esther is saying, I want you to know my name. That when a person faces such darkness, and whatever that means in their life or their loved one's life, not only should they not think that they are victims that were sent into crazy places because of their evil or their guilt, on the contrary, they were the souls that are going to heal the society. They are the souls that are going to bring light to society. They are the souls that save the Jewish people. They are the souls that reveal the truth. They are the souls that empower everybody to extricate themselves from doubt and darkness and wretchedness and to be able to experience the true bliss, the true delight of the fact that even that even when I faced it and I didn't understand why and I still don't understand why because it's Adela Yada. But I should never ever doubt that my soul's light was fully present and fully luminescent and fully bright in that moment. Completely, completely untouchable. Its holiness only becoming infinitely far more powerful. Have a wonderful week and a very, very happy and uplifting Purim. Verstehst? Adelayada. Adelayada. This class is brought to you by the yeshiva.net. Please help us continue the classes. Make even a small contribution at www.theyeshiva.net slash donate.